Lucy and Hannah originally ran their charity from their parents' home here in Barry, up the road, but raising money here to fund projects around the world. During the, this time, she studied and gained a degree in international development and religion at the Open University. She became an inspirational speaker on the Millennium Development Goals and the work of Safe Foundation. And some of you Soroptrius, fellow Trist sister Soroptimists, will remember when Lucy came and spoke to the Mount Sorrel Hotel about her work. Um, she's also uh, been involved in our local charity, Vail for Africa, to support community projects in the Tororo district of Uganda. But all we're always so wise in terms of advising us on the way forward. Lucy was also a talented musician and songwriter, performed locally and across the world with Hannah in her band Amber Hour, and received many awards, including the UN Gold Star Communities Award, supported by the Welsh Government Wales for Africa programme. And she was rec recognised as an inspirational social entrepreneur by the charity Unlimited in Wales. Tragically, Lucy died when she was doing charity work with a group called the Monzi District Land Alliance in Zambia when she died in a road accident on 19th of August 2012. And she was in Zambia as part of an international learning opportunities project working with a partner charity, Emerging World, doing advocacy work for women who suffered land, land rights abuse. So this is the bench where Lucy and Hannah, as we've heard, came to celebrate their birthday. And I think it's a very fitting place to start this walk in memory of inspirational women in Barry. Thank you. Oh, thank you. To know that this prestigious composer of the 20th century is a Barry girl and that she had scholarships and international travelling scholarships to Vienna and refused uh, an OBE in 1967, I'm not doing this with my notes now, mm. and um, <clears throat> was, was a very sensitive soul. Yeah. She used to sit on the Nat Beach, look out at the pebbles and some of her sea sketch compositions yeah. are definitely located down at the Nat. Yeah. So she died at 70 and left a huge legacy for us in Wales and the music world. And um, I to think of her, I know she was born in Rainbow Terrace, but ended up here with her parents. To think that she was a, you know, a prodigy, really, learning three instruments, learning violin, piano, a very young age, fantastic, wonderful. So are we going to bob a curtsy? Yes. <laughs> Grace Williams. <laughs> yeah, we bob a curtsy. Elizabeth was born in Carmarthen in 1851, so I think she's probably the first of our ladies to put Barry on the map. Her father, Dr John Hughes, was Carmarthen's first medical officer of health. Her mother Anne, née Phillips, was the descendant of Jewish ref refugees. I think she had two sisters and two brothers. I know one brother was a colonel, and this was actually his house. And the other brother was a lay preacher with the Lesley Wesleyan Society. She had little education as a child, but from the age of about 13, she attended Hope House Private School in Taunton. She later attended Cheltenham Ladies College and then taught there for five years. In 1881, at the age of 30, she was admitted to Newham College, Cambridge. She was the first woman to achieve first class honours in philosophy and a year later, second class in history. Cambridge did not award degrees to women at that time, although she did get a, a certificate, not a diploma. In 1885, Elizabeth was appointed principal of the Cambridge Training College of Women. As she believed that education was everyone's birthright, she made her lecture rooms available to working men as well as working women on Sundays. She was passionate about physical education for women. In her part time, she was a mount mountaineer and climbed the Matterhorn when she was 48 years old. Wow. <laughs> I never heard of her. Incredible. In 1889, at the age of 49, 
she left Cambridge and travelled to Japan. There she became the first woman ever appointed to a position in a male university in that country when she became Professor of English at the University of Tokyo. She undertook lecture tours in Europe and America and whilst in the USA investigated issues relating to prison reform. She helped to promote the concept of probation when, when she came back to the United Kingdom. She retired to this house, which I say belonged to her brother, Colonel Hughes, where she com continued to campaign for better sexual education. Whilst in America, she was surprised at the existence of clubs for women. So in 1902, she formed the Barry 20th Century Club, in which women of all classes could meet and learn together. The club, unsurprisingly, was a great success and by 1923 had a membership of 700. Wow. And we were worried about our membership going up. <laughs> in the First World War, in her 60s, she helped start the first Red Cross hospital in Barry. She was commandant of that hospital and was one of the first people to be awarded an MBE, which she accepted. <laughs> she was the only woman on the committee who was drafted the Charter of the University of Wales in 1920, oh sorry, and in 1920 she received an honorary degree from that university. Elizabeth would surely have been labelled a blue stocking, but I think she also had a fun side, especially as she took the bardic name Merth Merthyn, Girl Merlin, Harry Potter, eat your heart out. <laughs> Elizabeth died at the age of 74 in 1925. In 1948, when Cambridge finally gave women degrees, Hughes Hall was, was renamed in her honour. It is the only college named after a woman in, the, in Cambridge University. A blue plaque has now been placed in Carmarthen, the town of her birth. And I found on the internet two pictures. That is her. Lovely. And I also think she's got little frilly tops on, I think, you know, strong, pretty woman. And this photograph was the 20th Century Society on a holiday in France. So I'm sure there's some of our grandparents and ancestors here. And I think it must be because the hotel I, I go to doesn't exist anymore, the Pension Baromont de Tranche, but it must be the trenches area. So possibly the Somme in France. Yeah. So I should, anyhow, you can have a look at it later. But I can't believe how amazed I was when I started researching this woman. Absolutely incredible, and the fact I'd never heard of her. We've come to the house where the former mayor and le leader of the Vale of Glamorgan County Council, Margaret Alexander, was born, number 36. Her father was Wilfred Alexander, who was deputy head of Barry Boys County Grammar School. Her mother was a nurse, but she didn't work after she married. And when her father died suddenly, and Margaret was successful, she'd been at the grammar school, in going to teach a training college in Birmingham, her mother said, you must go to college, Margaret. And her mother took in lodgers to pay the bills. So having taught, Margaret taught for 30 years before returning to live in her hometown of Barry, she became, when she came back, she became involved in the Labour Party and stood for the election to the new Vale of Glamorgan County Council in 1995. And I have to say, when she came back and retired, she also took up other interests. She became a published poet and a short story writer. Margaret Alexander was a remarkable person who was greatly loved and admired in Barry for her unstinting commitment and dedication to her work as a councillor in the Buttrell's Ward for 17 years. She was also Mayor of the Vale of Morgan County Council 2006 to 7 and was the first woman Labour leader in 2007 8, and during which time she led the council with great skill and diplomacy. Completely clear and honest about her principles, values, and convictions, she stood up for social justice and fair play, championing her schools. Of course, she was a teacher, but she was governor uh, and chair of governors at Gladstone Primary School. She also was chair of the Vale of the Morgan Women's Forum, 
and campaigned tirelessly for women's rights and equality. She was the inspiration behind the Dorothy Rees Memorial Lecture. We'll hear more about Dorothy Rees shortly. Uh, remembering our Labour MP who, like Margaret, was born and brought up in Barry and served her town with distinction. Uh, as an Assembly member and friend, I always found Margaret's wise advice and sound judgement irrefutable. She often told me off, put me straight, um, but she was also very supportive. She had unswerving loyalty to her friends and colleagues, but was clear and uncompromising with advice and guidance. She was admired by all who knew and worked with her across the whole political spectrum and greatly respected. One of the two, two of the projects I was involved in with Margaret was to set up a women's only swimming session in Barry Leisure Centre, which actually still, still functional on Sunday afternoon, when we were approached by some Muslim women in Barry saying that they had no opportunity to, they ha couldn't swim, had no opportunity to swim in a women only sessions. And um, Margaret got it sorted from the council's perspective, and I gave her the backing. And that was for a, a very important group in Barry called the Rainbow Group with um, minority ethnic women. And as I said, that women only swimming, which actually is open to all women in Barry and lots of women like swimming just with other women, uh, still operates in the, the leisure centre. But she was also involved in setting up a group called the Castaways Group, which is a group of very active elderly people who used to be at, at Wandle House and then they left when the functions changed there and moved around um, to different settings and they're now at Golaika Reddig. Her sudden and swift illness was a great shock after her great victory in the May 2012 elections and she's still, still so greatly missed. She'll go down in history as one of the most remarkable women of the town of Barry. Her partner Yvonne Morris, who's here with us today, as she lived in Trinity Street, and as uh, Yvonne does, she lived and ha still live, Yvonne lives there for over 40 years. Yes. Yeah. Uh, many of you will have heard of the Purple Plaque Initiative to recognise remarkable women in Wales. Um, and also, uh, I just think I have to say that um, Margaret is one of those who, like many women in Wales, deserves a purple plaque. So watch this space and hopefully you can think about uh, a nomination. So again I would say thank you to Margaret for always, for us particularly us women in politics, for always being on our minds and in our conscience and thank you for her parents who brought her up <laughs> in this house in Barry and thank you for Yvonne for joining us today, her partner in life and in everything she believed. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I've got one observation about Margaret, that um, she was a very ethical individual, as Jane has said, and I can remember being in Rheinbelden with the twinning exchange of Vale of Glamorgan artists with artists from the Vale, from Rheinbelden, Mouscron, Facon, putting up an exhibition, and the Mayor, the Burgomaster of Rheinbelden took those of us that had been put doing the work, and Margaret was due to arrive. All the, the, the bling from Barry arrived. Margaret, thrifty and penny conscious, didn't fly out with them. She came overland in buses and trains, Isn't right? right yeah. And saved well, the Vale. I was there, yeah. And saved the Vale of Glamorgan, yeah, a huge amount of money. She but she was So we didn't overlap, but uh, they were so <coughs> proud to say, Margaret's coming, you know. She wouldn't overland. use the mayoral car. That's she right. used her own car. She was incredibly ethical very, where very local principled. funding comes from. So I do remember that, and I remember at my daughter was only about 13 didn't get to meet her because we, we had to leave then. But yes. uh, very ethical lady. Thank you very much right. for that. That's I remember, is there, what you yeah, remember? thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Do you want to say anything? I'm, about? I'm not a great one for speeches. I leave those to Jane, and that was a wonderful one, Jane. It's very moving for me. But if you've got any questions about Margaret, the only thing I have brought is not really the weather for standing outside in the freezing cold and rain. But in the, we'll go for sandwiches. Yeah, but um, I've brought some. This is one for you, Jane. I won't read that out because I, that's one you've asked for for a long time. It's called The Politician. She had a ton of oh, glass, I tell you. Um, she wrote this um, just after her father died. Her, her father died quite young. He was deputy head of, of Barry Boys and he came home one day and had a massive heart attack and literally just sat down and died. 
and left her in another penniless actually but she, they had a struggle after that but anyway she wrote this and it's about the grief of losing the, the grief of losing her father and it's about a Barry that no longer exists I don't know how many of you are from Barry and remember Barry as it was it's called this town this town where houses litter coal stained reaches and terrace terraces check the hills drift to oil glazed docks haunts me with echoing Sundays and strange chapels torments me where rearranging skies and slate shot seas stepped pebbles climb the foreshore groaning in the ebb and suck of the waning tide gantry stretch skeletal arms where coal wagons empty now still lie the distant clang of the trimmer's pick punctuates the foghorn's muffled bleat in sidings, weed encrusted, dank old engines lean. Sodden, sober streets threaded with braided light line the tilting winds, channeling tilting hills, channeling the winds. Footsteps ring on steel wet stone, broken tongues stutter against weathered bone, and I, fatherless among the gales, wander in the salt brain stand. That's wow, that's after a dad. I think that's. <laughs> Sorry to make you all stand for sub zero <laughs> temperature. Well, as we can see, we've got a plaque here for Major Edgar Jones, uh, who is a very prominent person in uh, academic and, and educational circles in Wales, uh, but nothing to commemorate the women of this household, and two of them, Annie Gwen Jones and her daughter Gwyneth Jones, certainly deserve to be remembered too. They were a very prominent family. I'll pass this around afterwards. And in this photograph, they're in the garden uh, in Ariel, and we have Annie Gwen Jones, that I'll say a few words about, and her daughter Gwyneth. I'll talk about Annie first, and this is her sitting on the balcony at Ariel, and really interestingly, I was looking at the photograph of the 20th Century Club now, and I think I can spot her in there, uh, because she was one of the co-founders of the 20th Century Club with um, Elizabeth Phillips Hughes. And, uh, and became the president later. They did a lot of travelling. Annie Gwen then. Um, apparently she possessed a disposition of charm and great friendliness, keen intelligent interest and a great knowledge of so many branches of learning and this singled her out as a lady of outstanding abilities. And she's also described in uh, an obituary in the Barian District News as um, a lady of unbounded enthusiasm mm -hmm. and she was of course very prominent in public and educational affairs in Barry. She was born um, Annie Gwen Sheehan Jones and she was born interestingly in Dowless in Merthyr. She studied at the University College as you say in the University College of, of Cardiff and Aberystwyth and it was in Aber that she met Edgar, Edgar Jones. Ed offered the place of being a governess um, she was completely bilingual and um, Arthur Hughes, who was John Hughes's son, wanted his children to have uh, a, a Welsh-speaking governess and so she went, she had the opportunity of going there and she's written about that, a lot of it is on the web, um, on the, on the, <coughs> pardon me, the website of Cyril Colley. But they became very prominent in Barry. Uh, she and her husband established the Barry Cymbrodorion Society, which is the Welsh Society in Barry in 1906. They were very prominent with, with things that were ha everything that was happening in Barry. And um, they were among the group that invited the National Estelver to Barry in 1920. Later she became a magistrate, Annie now became a magistrate, um, and served for many years on the bench in the, as a Glamorgan County Magistrate. During the Second World War, she was the chair of the Barry YMCA Canteen um, and one of the two women members of the South Wales Conscientious Objectors Women's Tribunal, uh, Conscientious Objectors Tribunal, one of the two women members. Her daughter, Gwyneth, um, who's standing here, she taught in Swansea, Swansea High School. French was her subject and then she came back to Cardiff and she spent the 1930s um, as the French mistress in Cate's Girls Secondary School in Cardiff. 
Um, at that time, she was secretary of the British Federation of University of Women. She died um, with her niece, Cyril, Cyril Colley, who was a doctor up in Nottinghamshire, in Bas Basford in Nottinghamshire, in July 1996. And she's interred in Barry Cemetery. Today is about Barry, and it's about us remembering the special women of Barry. And we've only touched the tip of the iceberg. We have a fantastic Barry Women's Trail. Today, congratulations to all the wonderful women who have paved the way for us in 20th century UK. And we're going to find out about a few more in our little mini conference this afternoon. We're going to hear about some other famous Barry women. And we're trying to be a little bit more organic and inclusive by doing it as an in-conversation or panel discussion. I'm going to hand over now to Janet Clark and Vivian. <coughs> Janet actually lives in Dr. Lennox's house, the court, which is the Dovecourt house as you drive down the Aston Road. What I found out about from Mary Lennox uh, who I, I never met, but uh, I knew of because she was uh, in one of the GP practices and I would write letters there uh, from time to time for my work. Uh, she, she was known as the first medical officer uh, of Health Valley, which caused a little bit of uh, stir when it happened because uh, this was a first. She was um, born Mary Williams and she trained as a medical student during the 1930s in Cardiff where she met her future husband, who was always known as Bryn. And they married in 1940, but by then Bryn was already called up to serve in the RAMC. In due course, uh, Patricia, you just met, heard mentioned, was born and they, she and her, her mother lived with Bryn's parents for, for a while while he was serving uh, during the war. After the war, uh, Mary was a, a school medical officer and appointed the MOH in Valley in 1943. And then in 1947, she became the court medical officer and medical superintendent of Ballyac, Barry Maternity Hospital, and the Neil Kent Infectious Diseases Hospital. She also uh, worked in the public health laboratory investigating the link between salmonella in uh, Patois meat factories and shops and the meat products. They practiced, uh, they, they have a, a, a general practice in 161 Holton Road next to the McGill's and there's a, a little bit I picked up on, off the internet of a pat saying how she had to be quiet during surgery hours uh, because they lived above and all the noise could be heard below. Um, after that, they moved into the boat, and I don't know the date. I'm sure you could. You in 1950. Yes. They moved into the boat in 1950. Yes. Over to you. Okay, all right then. I'm just to fill in a few gaps then. I do believe that Mary Lennox, can you hear me all right? Brilliant. Was a trailblazer for women in Bali. She moved to Bali with Bryn and their baby daughter, Pat, in 1943. Pat was born in 42, and as they've said, they initially lived with Bryn's parents in Virtuals Road. At that time, she worked as a community medical officer doing the school and baby clinics. Mm. Then in 1944, she was appointed the deputy medical officer for Bally Borough, and when the medical officer died in 47, she applied for his job. Now, there's a lot of opposition to this, as you can well imagine, a woman. Yeah. But she was elected, she was probably the best person for the job, and she became the first medical officer for help in Barry. Then we come to, she was also the court medical officer, 
and she went out with a pilot to the to any ship that there were suspected any diseases on. She had to wear trousers to climb up and down the rope ladder. Well, that raised a few eyebrows, didn't it? A professional woman wearing trousers. That was not the attire for, for a woman in those days. In 1948, Pat, because I, I talk, I've talked to Pat and she's told me all this information, she recalls there was a suspected case of smallpox on the ship. And she remembers she was woken up at night, in the middle of the night, and given a vaccination against smallpox. Prior to her mother the next day going on board that ship, fortunately, it turned out to be chickenpox. There was another occasion for she recalls, in April 1950, when a ship named the Pamir was loaded with 4,230 tons of bagged barley. When that was being unloaded, they found the cargo hold was just full of rats. So Mary was called out and she confirmed that the rat infest I can't even say this, <laughs> infestation was abnormal and got the hatches rebuttoned. Mary would not allow any other boats to go alongside, and she posted watchmen around the ship. The Palmyra and her sister ship, the Pass Passat, had come from New Zealand and Australia. Now the barley was for Britain, which that was still experiences food shortages after the war. The problem was, how could they get rid of these rats? They couldn't use cyanide, because they, the ship was too near land and that would have been clouds of poisonous gases here. So they went and asked the local rat catcher. He said, terriers will do the job. That's terriers as in dogs. So Mary took her two terriers and some doggers took theirs and they believed that the dogs saw off about 5,000 rats. And I do wonder how many escaped and their descendants are still in the dogs. And, yep, as you were said, that she worked with the Health and Warranty Service investigating the link with Salamanella. And one story that I found online was the hunt for the poison duck is on. I'll read that later, but um, it was about. Mary Lennox found that the food poisoning a child had suffered was attributed to eating a cake mixed with a duck egg. She traced the supply shops and the depot that was responsible for providing 600 eggs, duck eggs to Barry. She told <coughs> the, the help board that the investigation would continue and for the benefit of the mayor and Mr. A. R. M. Rook, who expressed a liking for duck eggs, she added, she, asked, she added that they would be safe if hard boiled and well fried. Now in 1962, I don't know if you ladies can remember this, there was a smallpox outbreak in the Rhonda. So she was sent there to vaccinate people and to review their contacts. Indeed, I don't know if you ladies can remember, but I do remember queues outside their surgery in Houghton Road, people waiting for vaccinations. Harry Maternity in Woodland Road and the Neil Kent in Colcott Road. Now, I hadn't heard about the Neil Kent, but that was an infectious disease hospital where now our Barry Community Hospital is. She was also on the Borough Housing Committee where she advised on poor housing conditions that were affecting people's health. In 1995, named the community room after her. Also, don't forget the Lennox Green down by the malls, that was named in her honour as well. The amount about uh, Dorothy Rees was quite limited. There were lots of websites, but they all said the same thing, like they do. Um, but I think, fortunately, Margaret's found something else, and then if any of you can contribute, that would be good. She was born on the 29th of July in 1898, so just before the turn of the century. 
and was a Labour Party politician in the United Kingdom and briefly a Member of Parliament. She originally was a school teacher in South Wales and then became a member of the Barry uh, Borough Council and an alderman of what was Glamorgan County Council then. At the 1950 general election, Barry was a new constituency and she was elected um, as an MP at, in 1950. But it was quite short-lived because um, she lost her seat in 1951, so she was only actually an MP for about 18 months at the general election. And the Conservative Raymond Gower, who I'm sure quite a few of you will remember, he, he won the post. Um, but even though she was only in Parliament for 18 months, she served as a parliamentary private secretary to Edith Summerskill, the Minister of National Insurance was her title. Um, she also served as a member of the National Advisory Committee for National Insurance and the Joint Education Committee for Wales, that's the Examination Board, and the Welsh Teaching Hospitals Board. I think her claim to fame was not that by any means she was the first woman MP, but she was the first woman to be elected in what was considered to be an industrial type area, more of a man's area in those, considered in those days. So I think that that's what she was recognised for, that she had um, become an MP in not a, an area that would normally uh, attract a woman. Um, she was an awarded, she was awarded a CBE in 1964 and became a Dame of the British Empire in 1975. She lived until 1987 and um, she was 89 at the time. That's more or less all I know. I don't know whether Margaret has some more. No, I think you've covered most of it, I've got to say that. Um, it was a very unusual appointment when she did win the seat. Uh, but she fought for people that was in poverty, and that's the most important. She served on the, on the council as well. It wasn't just as an MP. She served on the council, the old Barry Bar. She was the chairman of different committees, and she soon got her voice here. She wanted to bring more to the communities. She wanted people to understand that everybody was equal. Uh, she was appointed uh, Freeman of Body in 1956, but I'm very honoured really because the Labour Party does honour her every year. And it will be this Sunday. And it's called Dorothy Reese Tea Party really, but there is a candle lit. And it started in 2002, and I was the first person to light that candle. I was mayor of Valley then, and I was the first person to light that candle. And here today, speaking about it, as mayor of Valley. <laughs> so I think we've covered mostly about Dorothy, but uh, we need more women. We need more women to come forward like Dorothy and get our voice here. So please, if you've got time on your hands, Get everybody to listen because everybody got something to say. Well, it was absolutely fascinating to hear more about these inspirational people who've done so many amazing things. And without events like this, we just wouldn't really have heard of them. I really enjoyed it because even though I live in Barry, um, I didn't realise about some of the women who were very prominent. So the Lots of things I've sort of learned today that I didn't know about these people. Yeah. Stories uh, of these women, because as walkers we just go to the spot, but we don't learn about, uh, you know, who's behind the face and who's behind the building. Um, well, it was really interesting actually. The um, each person who spoke at each location had done an enormous amount of research um, and I learned an awful lot. What we've done is this amazing walk, remembering our special women of Barry, uh, musicians, politicians, uh, international scholars. Okay, so it's about putting women on the map in Barry. We are celebrated 
by Sir Optimist International UK because we are the largest group. So we meet monthly but we're involved in lots of charity work um, with young people, um, girls, helping girls not have poverty of aspiration, teaching uh, junior school boys and girls uh, things about sustainability, equal opportunities uh, and that kind of thing.